Let me invite David to come back up and join Anna, and uh, I'm going to ask them a question while everyone in the audience is getting their questions ready. So um, let me uh, maybe ask each of you, you've mentioned it, and you've mentioned obviously we're interested in public-private sector, and in this case we're talking about business community as well as civil society. I know we can get into um, sort of discussions about definition, but um, I wonder if each of you could just reflect on the visibility or presence of the private sector, how you've seen that change. Have you seen a change? Because you've both been working in urban environments, doing research and, and looking, evaluating interventions in urban environments for, for a while, and maybe I'm just talking a little bit about um, is, our, is, the, our, is the business sector present? What are some of the issues? Could you just, just reflect on it? Maybe, Anna, you're, you're warmed up, so I'll let you start um, having just given your talk. Well, I, I think um, my sense is that there has been increasing interest over time of the private sector in, in these issues and thinking about how the private sector can be involved and how the private sector can partner um, I think there, it's, um, it's not as present yet, I think. Perhaps the, I think there are lots of opportunities, but I think there's been certainly we've seen increased interest um, from different sectors that have approached us about learning more about this issue and how, you know, where, where, where the private sector can fit in and contribute most effectively. I'm not sure... Um, um it's completely new, but I've certainly seen over time uh, more interest in economic opportunity and certainly uh, health as a benefit that goes along with that. Um, you know, uh, Mayor Bloomberg put together an economic opportunity uh, consortium bringing together businesses. Uh, and, and looking at it, I think from a uh, a social and uh, physical built environment uh, context. So that's one example. If I think about it in the global uh, context, I, I think there's a lot of work that can uh, be done and encouraged. And so that's part of the uh, reason for bringing up housing is just one example, is I think there really is a lot of opportunity for engagement. I just uh, got a note passed. We weren't sure he'd be able to make it, so I didn't announce it ahead of time. But Andy is, in fact, on the phone, um, so you can extend your questions to him. Andy, I don't know if you heard the question. I was just asking in the did, yeah. work that you're doing, what, how have you noticed it, how, or have you noticed a shift in the engagement of the private sector, of business especially? Well, can, I just check, can you hear me all right? Perfectly. Good. Uh, well, I mean, I endorse what, what the previous speakers have said. I think there is a great opportunity for the private sector uh, and I think there are a number of ways in which they can be engaged. So um, there's the traditional players like, um, you know, the, the public tra the, the transport companies, uh, some of which are private, um, the housing companies and so on. Um, some of the, they've been engaged, I think, to a rather variable degree. So um, I think many of them are still thinking rather traditionally, uh, particularly in housing, for example. Um, Whereas there are really big opportunities, I think, to create new forms of housing, which will dramatically reduce the environmental footprint, but also uh, enable a very much healthier and more sustainable kind of indoor household environment. And I think we probably haven't capitalized on those opportunities enough. Uh, we, we had a recent uh, seminar at the London School, which brought in some kind of innovative players in the private sector, which was, which was uh, Kind of encouraging so there was a renewable energy company there which uh, is pretty well zero carbon they're seeing big market opportunities now in reaching out i mean particularly to to urban subscribers but there are also interesting innovations in the food sector as well so for example people looking at uh, kind of hydroponics um, aquaponics integrating uh, aquaculture um, and um, you know sustainable aquaculture sometimes in urban settings so I think there are a lot of emerging uh, businesses now which could be included much more effectively in the kind of uh, discussions that we're having. And one of the tasks, I suppose, is to map out this rapidly emerging, uh, often very innovative private sector to see how best we can engage them uh, in our dialogues. And I should have added in my presentation, just endorsing what, what Anna said about the Wellcome Trust. I mean, we're also involved in one of their projects, Complex Urban Systems. Uh, for sustainability and health. And the work that we're doing very much 
parallels is complementary to that which Anna described, but with a different ge geographic focus. So in China, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and in Europe. So I think there's a lot of commonality there and probably a lot of additionality by working more, more closely together. Well, uh, just a, a couple of the points that were made, and that is uh, there are examples of uh, government making relationships with uh, private and the bus rapid transit system, I think, was one of the suggestions that was there. So there'll be more talking about transportation later on. And um, um, certainly now some of the work of architects and one of the ones I had mentioned on the side was uh, Anna Dyson, D-Y-S-O-N, write it down, keep an eye on her, because uh, she is really uh, developing sustainable housing on a small uh, scale that is affordable and, um, you know, that, uh, again, is industry going to bring that up? One of the things we've talked about in our forum um, is, is we perhaps have many of the more traditional players in the health sector having been involved in the health care delivery system. Have we, we've had others as well, but as this opens up, as other companies really beginning to think about um, the opportunities here. May I open the floor for questions? We have a name, Sue Parnell. Uh, if you're on, Sue, you're ahead of the, your schedule. She's our, one of our, our kickoff speaker after the break, but um, you're welcome to, to chime in if you like. Um, around the forum table, any questions from forum members? <laughs> yes, Rebecca Martin. Thank Just, you. Yeah, much. tell everyone who you are as sure. well. So it's a good introduction for the so audience. Rebecca at large. Martin from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Thank you so much for these excellent um, discussions and talks. And one area I want to talk about is sort of unincorporated areas because many times urban areas grow because, as we've talked about, people move from rural to urban areas, but they're not incorporated into a governance structure of a city. And how do you promote or engage um, private sector and others to come and provide services, but also the policies that should be? Because many times these are the neglected communities and they're not engaged. So how do you drive that as well? Thank you. That's a problem. Um, Certainly, uh, uh, for the government, initially, you know, it was can we just bulldoze these and maybe the people will go away uh, because of the limited resources. And I think people have become more enlightened over time about how to accommodate. And uh, there there's so many issues that are involved there in terms of, of uh, registering uh, who is uh, living in those areas and then what kinds of basic services to get out to people uh, even before uh, there, there's further development. And so we've seen uh, concentrated efforts of this in uh, India, and reason for bringing that up as an example, and uh, look at opportunities uh, for seeing how this happens in Africa. Uh, there's some really excellent um, examples and stories in Latin America, but um... yeah, I would just add that you know we tend to um, sometimes we uh, well you know we we really oversimplify the urban rural distinction. In fact, there's a whole continuum. And if you start looking at how we're characterizing urban. You know, it's a Pandora's box, really, what we're talking about. There's incredible heterogeneity, and within that heterogeneity, there's also um, the governance and jurisdiction issues. So there's often a core city and areas around it that are highly influenced by the city, but are, you know, are under a different jurisdiction. And so I think part of the challenge is thinking about the governance issues in terms of how how those how policies across if these different areas how they're they're connected and how they're integrated um, so it's a it's a really important topic and in particular I mean certainly in the u s and perhaps we will see this in other parts of the world as well you know there's been as uh, as core cities have become gentrified there's been displacement of sometimes low income and and minority populations into peripheries of cities and so what does that mean you know which are quote suburban they're not really the city but they're they're urbanized and so that so it's a very uh, very important issue i think to think about andy would you like to come in 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree that governance is crucial. And I think increasingly cities around the world are recognizing that they can't just dis displace and dispossess uh, these uh, informal communities. Um, so I think it depends very much on, on the country. Uh, some of the work we've been doing in Kenya has been involved with um, informal settlements. Um, and what's clear, I think, is that the local governments do increasingly consider themselves as having a role there. And of course, um, you know, with, with local democracy, if local democracy is relatively vibrant, then it means that these people uh, do have some kind of representation, do have some kind of political input into local government. One of the uh, strategies we've been using in Kenya is to actually uh, support local government in bidding for funds. Uh, the example I would give is the Green Climate Fund, which, as you know, has quite substantial uh, funds for climate change adaptation and mitigation. But it's often quite difficult for low-income countries and cities to access those funds. So we've been trying to work with them through this Welcome Trust project to help them in creating uh, credible bids for funding. It's still too early to say how successful we'll be. But if it is successful, then it will leave uh, uh, new sources of funding into some of these informal settlements. So as part of that, we've been consulting with the local government and with local communities what, what they see as priorities and trying to integrate their local priorities with what um, the Green Climate Fund wants to see. So, for example, in Kasumu, in Kenya, one of their priorities is waste, uh, waste disposal, solid waste disposal. So we're thinking about ways in which we can make that um, appropriate for bids to the Green Climate Fund by, for example, methane capture and uh, you know, reducing emissions from, from waste. We're also also looking at innovative uh, transport strategies as well, um, opening up kind of green routes uh, between some of the informal set of settlements and, and the city centre. So these are just some examples. But I would agree that governance is, is crucial uh, in uh, ensuring that these informal settlements are, are not neglected and um, disadvantaged. I think one of just to mention in the high level political forum that happens each year at the UN, um, one of the dominant themes and when you go to every session on urban, um, one of the dominant themes is land rights. Um, it's usually the first dominant mm -hmm. theme followed closely by climate change or pollution. And we, we don't get the word health doesn't show up very much, but the land rights issue is very much on people's mind. Let me just um, to keep our diversity going here, uh, Scott Ratson and John Monahan from the forum, and then we'll open it to the audience. Uh, thank you, and thank you very much for the, the presentations, and, and Sir Andy, we saw you as well. Uh, my, my question relates to a broad determinant issue. I'm, I'm a senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School. I didn't uh, mention where I was. Uh, and I'm very interested in, in the idea of communication, so a communication determinant. And we've heard for years about the digital divide of urban, rural, and so forth, and those variables just haven't really shown up. So I'd like to just get any take on, is there such a determinant, not just on media ownership or that potential, but of course with the new technologies and then the public understanding of science and health that, that um, links all of these together. We have a panel later this afternoon specifically on that, but would you, either of you like to comment, or Andy, would you like to comment? Sort of communications as a determinant of as health, communication. I think. Well, free press, for example. We used to say free press will help private sector and health growth. I mean, now we don't talk about that as a, as a determinant. So, so that sort of level. I think that's a great point. I mean, certainly, uh, uh, you know, information, the way information travels and is shared is critical to health. And, 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 and so I think you're absolutely right. I think it may be an area that we have not paid as much attention to in this field as we should in terms of uh, its health impact and how it can be used for health or, you know, maybe not for health. Um, so I think it's, it's a real important area. Social media stuff as well and, and, and communication more generally, yeah. Andy? I think there are multiple issues around communication. So obviously there's the use of social and other media, which of course is is greatly expanding in, in, in low-income countries, and many people have uh, mobile phones, even if they don't have settled uh, settled accommodation or whatever. So this is, is changing quite dramatically. Uh, so there are burgeoning opportunities here. In terms of, um, you know, the free press, it, it's a sort of mixed message, I guess. I mean, obviously, in some parts of the world, the, uh, the press is dominated by special interests, and they would be advancing their own kind of interests. But in those parts of the world where there is a really free flow of information, then 
Of course, you can have a kind of open debate um, about the uh, the pros and cons of different uh, policies. I think what we do know is that um, you know ne negative messages about kind of doom and gloom don't empower people. So what we do need is positive messages about how to achieve development at much lower levels of environmental impact than we've achieved kind of in the West, for example. I think there's also real opportunities um, through with young people. So there's an increasing number of programs looking at kind of citizen science or science in schools. There are journals for kids science journals, which are very, very interested and engaged in this whole issue of sustainability. And of course, there's also um, programs to develop uh, leadership, um, often particularly focusing on young women. Uh, I know of uh, some work, for example, in, in Kasumu in Kenya, which is involving uh, uh, workshops for young women uh, to increase their level of ambition, to increase recruitment into professions like medicine, law, architecture, and so on, of uh, taking young women from disadvantaged communities to really engage them much more in this agenda of, of kind of urban sustainability and health more broadly. So I think there's an awful lot happening. A lot of it hasn't been properly evaluated, but I think there are new opportunities that weren't there a few years ago. John? I just wanted to build on Introduce that. Introduce yourself. Oh, I'm uh, John Monaghan <laughs> from Georgetown University, and, and uh, it's kind of the flip side of Rebecca's question. Uh, for, uh, rather than folk, I, I think the unincorporated areas are incredibly important, but it also seems to me, particularly Anna, in your work, um, you're going to see an enormous heterogeneity in the formal government authorities of the public sector at the local level. And is that provide an opportunity to learn about what's, what, what local government structures and what kind of formal authorities will make it more, allow some places to be more or less successful in addressing some of these really complicated cross-sector issues that you've identified? So that's a that's a great point, and that's one of the things that we're trying to characterize in the cities that we have. And, you know, it's hard to characterize that, right? How do you measure it? But but I think it's really important. It's a feature of governance in, in some ways. Characterize what models of governance are associated with certain kinds of trajectories for cities. Uh, there was a paper published, I think, a while ago by Mala Hudson and I think George Kaplan was on it, looking at metropolitan fragmentation in the U.S. in relation to mortality rates. Uh, I don't. Yeah, it was I th very interesting. I think to think about that, um, but I think it's a great point. Uh, International Society for Urban Health had a meeting in Nairobi, and there was a section on uh, community, a uh, section of the academics, right, doing their jamboree of ten-minute presentations. And then there was a section on mayors, and there were about 50 mayors that came to the meeting, so that was very exciting. But what we found is that uh, the diversity of uh, circumstances, so some of them uh, really were just implementers of whatever the national policy was and had very, very limited resources themselves, whereas I think uh, we tend to consider uh, mayors as having more authority, at least in our context over here, and budget. And so the variation uh, was really tremendous. I think the second part of that was also looking at what are the metrics. So for example, you'll see studies that are urban versus rural, and there's not the disaggregation of data. But when we start to see that, that really um, uh, may not always be uh, politically uh, palatable for the national leaders because it's highlighting uh, the differences uh, that can be troublesome uh, for for them. But, uh, you know, we see intra-urban variation, which I think is so important in terms of uh, government, in terms of international agencies, in terms of uh, foundations in the kinds of uh, projects that are supported. So data and variable government. Thank you. Andy, comment or? Well, if I could just, I mean, build on a couple of those points. I think it's both the kind of governance reaching up to the national level, which is important, and the governance reaching down to the community. Both are important. In some countries, uh, as we've heard, cities can be influential um, with national governments, particularly if they band together. 
but there are some things which are very difficult for cities to do um, of their of their own uh, in their own right. For example, if you don't have adequate carbon pricing nationally, then it's quite difficult for cities to really scale up uh, low, zero carbon energy. Um, and cities can play an important role in advocating for more sustainable policies at the national level. But there's also the, the kind of um, uh, lower level democracy, which is equally, if not more important, which is to what extent cities have representational platforms going out into local communities, particularly, as you said, the unincorporated or the informal communities. Do they have mechanisms for assessing kind of community views or consulting with the community and so on? And that varies a lot from one city to another. But I think where you see effective cities, uh, city mechanisms for consulting with communities, then clearly you get a lot more buy-in and you can ensure that the policies are really more attuned to the needs and perceptions of the local community, as well as reflecting uh, the kind of national policies. So it is quite a, a, a complex arena. It does depend a lot on where you are in the world. And the other variable really is to what extent cities themselves have direct responsibilities for the health sector or the health care sector. In many countries, um, you know, the health care sector is a national or a kind of provincial regional responsibility. But in some countries, um, the city administration does have a role in the provision of municipal health services. And there, of course, it's easier for them to influence the actual delivery of care. Um, uh, so, it, it, again, quite a lot of variability between countries in terms of uh, the governance mechanisms. But the point about the need to compare different approaches and to evaluate different approaches and experiments as far as possible, I think, is a, is a really important uh, and valuable lesson. And Sue, you flashed your picture. Does that mean you want to comment on this or, or hold your guns for, for after the se for your session next? I guess you just, uh, the picture no, came. That was a mistake. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let me, uh, if there are no other questions from forum members, we have a time for a couple questions from the audience. Um, Charlotte, speaking of mayors, uh, Charlotte Marchandez, who's going to be joining us later, maybe you could go to the mic, Charlotte, because I think there's a visual opportunity there that may not be, um, although maybe a, a negative visual opportunity coming to look at it, actually. Maybe you could go back to where you were going. Um, Charlotte's a deputy mayor of Rennes in France and uh, has been leading on the on health sector work. So maybe you'd like to comment on this or ask another question. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, yeah, I'm deputy mayor and Rennes is part of Couche, uh, the complex urban system for sustainability and health. Hi, sir, Andrew. And, uh, and I'll speak tomorrow on behalf of Rennes and also I'm sharing French and European Healthy City, WHO Healthy City Network. But before we go this afternoon to, to digital technology, there's something really important because smart cities is something developed all over the world that mayors love, usually, that uh, I don't see so many academic uh, linking with smart cities. I don't see so many innovators understanding the data, the kind of evidence we have on the complexity of urban health. And we know that data empower mayors, even when they don't have so much powers, they can do so many things. But the complexity of the evidence developed by the academic sometimes is not linked with the kind of, you know, easy way to understand smart cities that they make you think you can just monitor your city through a, a computer. So I think there's a big issue there that we can address equity through smart city in win-win strategies between academics, public, and private sectors. Thanks. Comments on, I think, big data is talked about a lot um, with smart cities. Can you comment on that? I mean, Ana, you've been down into... Uh, cities and areas around Latin America in terms of capacity, really, to uh, address the issue Charlotte's raising? Well, I mean, I agree with you 100%. I mean, 100%. Data is, 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 uh, is really important. As important is to draw meaning from data, right? And that's sometimes the challenge, right? Particularly with smart cities and the availability of data, what is it really telling us and, and how, what can we really use it to understand better, right? So, I mean, in our, in our, in our experience in Salurbal, um, I mean, we're not talking about very sophisticated uh, smart city data, although we may uh, get to that as well. But 
you know, even with the basic data, what we used to call little data, but it's actually pretty big, <laughs> uh, there's, an, there's a lot there that can be done, but it's not being done because the data is not being put together, harmonized, and looked at. And this is what we're doing. I mean, it's just a, compiling mortality data for these cities. I mean, this is a big job. And, and, it's, and it's incredible what you, can, what you can see from simple things like that or surveys that are being done. Or we have a team doing, using remote sensing information to characterize growth of cities in urban form. And so we're, but that's, that, you know, it's, it, it, it requires an investment of time and effort to be able to, to really uh, uh, extract meaning from this messy data. And I'm convinced that there is meaning there, but I think we have to be careful that we don't use data in ways that can be, you know, obfuscating rather than illuminating. I think, yeah, quick. Really good point about uh, smart cities. And the three of us that are up here uh, have our backgrounds in medicine and public health. And I think uh, the academics that are most involved, at least that I've interacted with, are you know, engineering and you know, computer science and management. And there's uh, more interaction uh, between these different uh, fields and, and really looking at the issue of smart cities. Uh, most of the work that I've seen so far are really in well-developed, you know, higher income uh, cities. And so how that extends to uh, low income settings is, I think, an opportunity. And last comment on this issue, you're looking from the global perspective. <laughs> Well, a uh, couple, couple of points. First of all, let me say um, that uh, we really need more people like Charlotte because Charlotte has really um, embodies both, you know, the technical expertise but also the political experience um, as deputy mayor. And I think that's been really invaluable. And so we somehow need people that can bridge that gap between the academia and the really the. the, the like the coalface or the, the, the frontline decision making at the urban level and we need to think about how we can strengthen the capacity to develop more um you know more human resources more people with those with those experiences mixed experiences but just quickly on the data issue very very interesting um there are obviously a lot of new advances through um earth system science for example there's now it's possible uh, and through modeling so as a recent paper, for example, on carbon emissions from 13,000 cities around the world, um, uh, there's obviously a lot of data now on air pollution, uh, some of that satellite um, mixture of modeling satellite data. So, you know, we have now air, reasonably reliable air pollution data in thousands of cities around the world. And we, of course, we have data on green space through satellite imagery as well, proximity to green space. But some work that we did, again, for the Wellcome Trust before this Kush project, where we tried to link um, health and environmental data in 250 randomly selected cities around the world, disclosed that there, was a, um, that there were big data gaps, particularly in the smaller cities that are rapidly growing. So these will be cities in Africa and Asia, which are quite small at the moment, but they are the ones that will grow over coming decades. And there we have very little data uh, indeed. So there needs to be an investment, perhaps not in all of them, but in a, in a range of these cities so that we can kind of capture them as they develop and, and expand. The other challenge which Anna alluded to was really linking health and environmental data, because often these are held by different authorities and they're on different spatial scales. And when you start to try and link health data to small level environmental data, you come up around issues of, of confidentiality uh, uh, and so on, of, of information. So there's sometimes a, a block from, you know, the national kind of ethics committees or whatever they're, the IRBs, um, to uh, accessing that very small scale state uh, health data. And we need to think about novel ways in which we can do that, that there are approaches, which I don't have time to go into, but there are approaches for um, uh, linking health and environmental data whilst maintaining confidentiality. But that requires some investment uh, in order to do that. So I think the potential is enormous. I think we haven't yet uh, reached that full potential, but I think as years go, you know, the years to come, there's a lot more that can be done to link the bottom up data around health survey data or routine health data um, with environmental data. And that's certainly going to be a very active field of research in years to come. 
Thanks very much. Let me uh, ask you to help me thank uh, Andy Haynes and Ana diaz Rue and David Blaha for getting us off to an amazing start. Lots to think about, lots to discuss. Um, we uh, will be moving in the second half of, of, today, of today, really drilling down into each of these sectors. We'll be looking at planning and at uh, disparities, food and transportation, as well as AI and digital, and then tomorrow morning uh, capping it off with a discussion of uh, public-private partnerships at the governance level with, with colleague mayors and CEOs of, of companies. So um, it's a great preparation. We thank you very much. And um, also, um, you'll, we'll kick off with Sue Parnell, who will not be absent nor uh, anonymous um, at 1130. So Sue, if you'll hold on with us. And uh, you uh, now have a break until 1130. And I think there's some coffee outside. And for those of you um, online, can take a rest break. And we'll see you back at 1130. Thank you very much.